for its active talent. That's a soft skill that really gets undersold in the hiring process. How to manage in the virtual environment. You get a diverse, cultured group of people. It's a win-win for everybody. More conversion from candidate leads. What does that look like in this new virtual world? Welcome, 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 everyone. It is Thursday, noon Eastern time, and you know what that means. It is time for Talent Experience Live, your weekly look at the hot topics in HR, interviews with leaders in the industry, as well as hot new HR technology, covering everything that you need to know in recruitment, talent acquisition, and talent management. Uh, And as tradition around these parts, I always love to hear from the audience where people are tuning in from, maybe what you're having for lunch today. Uh, I know my lunch starts immediately after the show ends, so I'll be having some avocado toast. Um, So definitely hop into the chat. We love to have your, your voices heard. And of course, if you have any questions for our guests, you can always fire them away there as well. Uh, while you are on our page and navigating to find the comment section, do not forget uh, to share this out to your network. Uh, a friend that shares is obviously a friend that cares, and we love getting uh, some of this great content that we are putting out into the intranets and into everyone's uh, LinkedIn as well as YouTube feeds. Uh, but if you're For some reason, not able to catch the full episode today, Uh, you can always catch the recap at phenom.com backslash blog. We always do uh, a nice, really digestible, bite-sized content uh, from the live stream shows where you can catch clips of some of the best moments as well as... um, a a breakdown uh, via text if you are more of a reader than a video watcher, or you can always uh, hop onto YouTube and catch the full recap if you enjoy watching or listening on your spare time. Uh, As the comments begin to roll in where people are joining us from, it looks like Kevin is joining us from Florida. Welcome, and George from New Jersey. Uh, Welcome, everyone. Boy, do we have a fantastic topic for you today. Uh, Today we are talking about reversing remote work uh, via burnout and insights from Gallup and some of the research that they did. Uh, Remote work burnout comes from much more than just long hours that I'm sure we are all familiar with. Uh, Gone are the days where we used to have maybe half hour, hour commutes, and now it is simply uh, 30 to 40 seconds, wherever it may be, uh, wherever your bed is located in your home and where your desk setup or uh, makeshift desk desk setup is. Um, But oftentimes, uh, burnout stems from employees experience a sense of failure um, to either be unseen or unclear communication with managers and unreasonable time pressures as well. Uh, And Gallup really dove into this and and showed a ton of great insight into this. It looks like Mary is also joining us from Massachusetts. Welcome, Mary. Uh, And someone else is joining us from Florida. Doesn't seem like it's Kevin, but if you see him, maybe say hello. Uh, So obviously a a great topic today. And before we jump into that, uh, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, for the guests today, feel free to fire them away into the chat. Hello, Belin from London in the United Kingdom. Um, but as tradition goes around these parts, I always love to start things off with an icebreaker question. And my first question is for you, the audience. Um, what is something that you may have been burnt out from? This doesn't have to be work related. It could be something as simple as sports. Um, or anything within your personal life. Uh, I know my personal burnout story comes from back in the day when I used to wait tables. There was something about that feeling of getting that pre-lunch or or pre-shift rush where you're scrambling around, you get maybe five minutes to take a break, have a sip of water, and then that next rush comes in again. And it was just something that that I was not cut out for for the long term. Uh, And I always enjoyed uh, my shift drink at the end of work. But that's unrelated. Um, And uh, it seems like Robert is joining us from Stone Harbor. Welcome, Robert. Uh, While you are here, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to Phenom content. Uh, Somebody else chimes in with being inside due to COVID has caused a tremendous amount of burnout. And that is a fantastic segue um, to 
uh, the remote or reversing remote work burnout that we have today with our guests from Gallup. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Widger and Jillian Anderson of Gallup as they talk about the root causes of remote work burnout, and most importantly, actions to turn engagement in the right direction. Uh, they'll also reveal some key data points from their research, real testimonials, and solutions for enabling better well-being, including inclusion, as well as motivation at work. So please, everyone hop into the chat and welcome Ben and Jillian. Hello, how are you both? Good. Devin, I have to say I love the intro music. I also can relate with the comment that came through on the chat of uh, being a little burnt out of being inside during COVID. I got to say it's getting nice here in Chicago and I'm I'm itching to get outside. It looks nice out there. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I think we all we all feel that way. Ben, how, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having us. Uh, I was thinking about your question today and I was like, geez, it's probably the Zoom technology, you know, whether it's Zoom, Teams, WebEx, this. I, I was like, I just hope I get logged in and um, I'm not on mute right now, am I? <laughs> no, no, you are not on mute, but uh, that has happened to me countless times. And I've also not been on mute when I thought I was, which is a nightmare within itself as, as well. Um, it is a tradition around these parts. I, I do always love to ask how people got to their journey as to where they are today. Um, obviously, this is a topic HR related. And I know a lot of people, um, when they are little ones, you know, types running around playing with their toys, when someone asks them what they want to be when they grow up, rarely do they say something involving human resources or involving that aspect. So I'll start with you, Jillian. How did you uh, get in your journey uh, to, to become an expert on, on really uh, what you and, and Gallup focus on? Yeah, great question, Devin. And you know, it's funny because I don't think I ever was a kindergartner who said I want to be a consultant when I grow up. <laughs> but yet, when I look back over my life, I think there's a lot of things that have brought me to where I'm at now. Um, I actually came to Gallup from graduate school uh, and studying communications. And uh, it was interesting at the time I had taken Strengths Finder, which is one of our assessments, and thought, oh, this is such an interesting, you know, insight into who I am and how I'm wired. And I didn't even realize at the time that it was Gallup that actually made the assessment. So I started talking um, with individuals who worked at Gallup at the time and thought, wow, this is incredibly impactful work. And for me, um, I love feeling like the work that I'm doing is getting to make a difference in, in the lives of individuals and help organizations perform better. So that's what drew me to Gallup. And then I've been here, it'll be 13 years in August, and so have developed more expertise around culture transformation and leadership development. And those have just become passion areas for me and living out that initial draw of helping people perform better and thrive better in their own lives, in their workplaces, and in their outcomes. That's that's awesome. Uh, I, I love to hear that. It would have also been great to see you as a kindergartner on the first day of school holding up one of those little chalkboards that said, when I grew up, I want to be a consultant. But yes. uh, that, that certainly, <laughs> certainly doesn't always happen. Ben, ben, how about you? What was your journey like? So unlike unlike Jillian, my dad was a psychologist, so I grew up at the dinner table talking about people and data. So I don't know if I I, I probably didn't make the sign, but they probably made me a T-shirt and made me wear it. Um, and and then that uh, that passion led me uh, to become an industrial organizational psychologist. And like Jillian said, really no better place to study and help people than Gallup. So it was a it was a pretty fun path. That's awesome. And I, I know Gallup is doing some fantastic things. Um, and obviously, this episode is all around burnout, which isn't necessarily a, a new topic, right? Um, I've heard about burnout um, really most frequently um, from like high school athletes who are constantly, um, you know, one sport year round, no days off, those sorts of things. And by the time they get, um, you know, to you know, the collegiate level, they're, they're burnt out, right? But it also happens in the workplace with a lot of people in their professions. However, it seems to have taken the forefront of the conversation over really the past year. So my question for you is, was this something that, that Gallup had been working on for years and really studying, or is it something that really came to the forefront uh, due to the pandemic and, and us being kind of trapped inside over, over the past 13, 14 months, whatever it's been now? Yeah, I love that. I love that question, Devin, because we've been studying employee well-being and engagement for a couple of decades now. Um, we really started to zoom in on burnout in about 2016 because we were seeing conditions that would obviously lead to burnout. You know, we were seeing um, people 
living with their devices, you know, taking work home with them on their devices, uh, working remote more often, working on matrix teams. Uh, you kind of have this 24 seven work schedule due to globalization. So we're seeing um, potential indicators like that. So we started studying it closely. And from about 2016 to 2019, burnout steadily increased um, to, to really concerning levels. Uh, in 2019, we released a report called The Causes and Cures of Burnout um, that curates some of that research um, that I'm happy to share with you folks. And in 2019, it became such a concern that actually the World Health Organization uh, reclassified it um, as a syndrome to be concerned about. And they reclassified it to help people understand what symptoms to look out for um, because it was becoming such a problem. Um, we were also seeing that physicians were really having problems with burnout. And it was one of their top issues they wanted to address. And this was 2019. So you can imagine kind of that groundswell of concern and then for 2020 and COVID to happen, I mean, it was like pouring gas on a fire. And that's probably an understatement. Um, so what, what Jillian and I thought would be fun to do is we'd actually like to share some exclusive data with you folks today. Um, we, we haven't released this in a report yet, um, but it shows how people experience 2020 through the lens of well-being and engagement. Um, so for those of you watching online, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some slides up really quick, but I'll speak to them like you're not watching so that you're not missing anything. Um, can you guys can you guys see this first slide? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it is okay. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Let me just lock in one and more. Ben, time. as you're as you're sharing there, I was just having flashbacks. I remember you and I actually working on this topic with clients before COVID hit. And so, you know, to Ben's point, this is something we've been measuring for a while. And I think it's it's been really interesting to actually track um, what's happened through this last year and the extra uh, perhaps emotional, uh, psychological stress, you know, Devin, you even referenced with, with anybody who's in sports, if they've experienced burnout, there's often a mental component that comes in with that. And so I think this last year, as all of us have, um, many individuals have had to uh, see work and life come together in ways that it's no longer about work-life balance, it's work-life integration. You know, we're all joining from our homes and um, a lot of people are balancing many, many things in particular this past year, all in the same space around them. And so we're feeling different kinds of pressures that that seem to amplify some of those things we were already starting to see um, before COVID hit. So that's just interesting context as we look at the data that, that Ben's pulled up here. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love to bring the voice of the employee to it too. Um, some of this first data I'll share uh, w w will not be a surprise to you. We've been tracking um, well-being for a couple decades, and obviously the most dramatic shift we saw was just um, employee well-being absolutely plummeting uh, when COVID hit. We haven't seen levels this low since the Great Recession, and I don't think we've ever seen a drop this sharp so fast. Um, you know, so that's just worth knowing right there. I think it honors what a lot of you have been feeling. Um, there's been some variability in it. It, it. it improved a little bit over the summer. Um, kind of when, when kids were out of school, people were outside um, and, and we were coping with it okay. But then it shot kind of right back down um, in, in the fall. So this is really notable because Gallup's measure of well-being has been associated with some really serious socioeconomic events. Um, when we've seen well-being drop like this in the past, it preceded some really serious events like Brexit, uh, the Arab Spring, the Maidan Revolution, uh, which actually makes sense if you think about it, when a country, when the people in a country are so miserable um, that you can measure a drop like that, you know, it's not surprising there's a reaction to that. So, you know, that was really concerning for us. Um, another data point to look at is how people's, um, stress and worry were affected on a daily basis. So their, their daily emotions, we saw a huge spike in stress and worry uh, when, when COVID really hit and people shifted, um, many of us working from home. And, and then what's also concerning is that this elevated level of stress and worry was sustained throughout 2020, so it became chronic. Um, and, and stress and worry can be coped with, but when they become constant, that starts to affect the way we feel, act, behave, and it starts to create some health problems. So that was concerning for us. And then um, you know, one more point on employee well-being. Um, it was actually worse for remote workers, or I should say even worse for remote workers. And, and substantially, those, those of you working from home remotely, and about 65% of people did shift to full-time remote for a while. Right now it's around 40%. Um, 
I mean, you're experiencing it. You, you, you may have kids at your feet. You may be isolated in your apartment. Um, you, you, it may be hard to collaborate with colleagues. You, maybe your day feels like it never ends and, and you work the weekend. So I'm sure this all resonates with you. But to see this big a difference in the data, especially when, I mean, it's, it's bad. It's bad for non-remote workers. It's really bad. Um, so for it to be worse for remote employees is, is worth noting. Now, on the flip side of things, if we look at employee engagement, this was a bit of a surprising, uh, but but a good a good surprise to us. Um, employee engagement remained relatively steady at a macro level. Um, we, we've me measured this for about 20 years. Um, in 2016, about 33% uh, of Americans were engaged in their work. And then in 2018, that went up a percent to 34 percent, then 35 in 2019. 2020, we ended the year actually with 36 percent of people being engaged. So it really kind of stayed on trend, which is really surprising to people because we, as we entered the pandemic, they expected um, in, in play engagement to plummet along with um, well-being because typically those two things move together. They're kind of hand in hand. When you're when you have um, good well-being, it's easier to be engaged. When you're engaged, you tend to have higher well-being, um, and they tend to complement each other in helping people be more productive um, and and have less burnout. Um, so it was interesting and concerning that they diverged and moved in different directions. There's a little bit more to the employee engagement story. We actually saw some volatility during 2020 we've never seen before. Usually employee engagement's a very robust, steady measure. I mean, it usually doesn't react to social events. In 2020, it had reached an all-time high of 38% in late May. And then weeks later, it, it, it tanked um, shortly after George Floyd's killing. Um, and it decreased by a lot. Seven percentage points is a lot for a macro measure like this. Um, and then crazy enough, two weeks later, it popped back up to a new all-time high of 40%. So we saw some volatility in there that kind of ex gets at the way people are experiencing and feeling about um, their jobs and their lives. Um, and just one more, one more point on the trends we saw in, in 2020 in regard to employee engagement. We saw that employee engagement was even higher and substantially higher for remote workers. So you have this scenario we're calling the well-being engagement paradox, where you have um, well-being being pulled down dramatically, while um, employee engagement is kind of floating in the other direction, which is unusual. And that's really a recipe for burnout, because people are really pouring themselves into their jobs. They're very involved. Um, so many of them are very happy to have a job. You know, they're helping their companies work through these changes and challenges and their own changes and challenges. Um, so they're putting all this energy into it like a merry-go-round. And at the same time, they have bad work-life balance and, and well-being challenges and stress. Um, so it's really a formula for burnout where we, we even saw pre-pandemic, the people who were engaged but had um, poor well-being were at risk for burnout. Uh, and, and now you have so many more people with, with poor well-being and so many more people working remotely. Um, the, we're just concerned that this is either going to be managed well and people are going to take advantage of um, you know, remote work and leaning into well-being or it's going to be left unmanaged and go the other way. Um, so with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to pass the ball to Jillian to really you know, dig into some of those testimonials she has in her experience um, consulting and coaching and talking about things we can do to help alleviate this. Yeah, wonderful. You, you know, it's it's also just fascinating for anybody who's listening, I think, to to filter this through your own experience during this time. And I think even just looking at, at what our clients have experienced, a, a lot of the clients that we work with around employee engagement have seen some gains over this past year. And you think about how much inside of workforces um, there was a lot of attention oftentimes given to hearing from your leaders, to having connection points, things that we know are actually good from that engagement standpoint at work. Um, and a lot of those things had to be very intentional when you're working more remotely. Um, but to Ben's point about the paradox, when you're experiencing increasing levels of worry and stress in your own life, that's not sustainable over time. That paradox has to sort itself out at some point. And I think that's the critical juncture that any organization is at, is how do you sustain Sustain that engagement, it's not going to happen if we don't also address the well being question. And so, um, you know, I love getting to partner because obviously I get to call. I get to call Ben Dr. Wigger once in any conversation, and then that, that's what I've been told, and then I have to call him Ben after that. So I've, I've used my once now, but he and the research team are just obviously have incredible insights and analytics around all of these topics. And for me, I, I love getting to 
to use this with our, our clients and see this come to life inside of organizations and bring some of the stories. So just to even bring a little voice to this today, one of the clients I'm working with right now, $44 billion uh, company that's 500,000 employees around the world. No one's immune to this topic. And I just completed, um, we, we essentially did interviews um, with individuals around this topic. And I pulled up a couple quotes just to bring to life this concept of burnout. And Ben's got this up on the screen here, but you know, for each of us, we were joking about this in our, our pre-show today. 76% of people have experienced burnout at some point in time in their career. So the likelihood that one of us that someone listening in today has experienced burnout at some point in their career is pretty high. Think about what that starts to actually sound like and feel like. I'll read a couple quotes from these interviews that I've been doing. Um, a lot of I feel statements that were coming out from individuals. So I feel overwhelmed trying to do it all. I feel like I'm failing at everything. I wake up and start work at 3 a.m. because I can't fall asleep with all the things swimming around in my head that I need to do. I can't see any end in sight. My family are worried about my health. I am too. Another quote, uh, particularly around this last year, racial injustice has played a role in my own burnout, contributing to emotional and, mo and mental well-being. I'll be 40 tomorrow, this individual says. We're still facing these things. I've mentally withdrawn from all that is going on. Uh, and then the last one I'll share here that always gets me when I hear this one, um, but I t in talking with this individual, they shared their kind of wake up call moment around burnout. And they said their daughter asked them if they could play one more thing before going to bed and they snapped at their own daughter. I could see her shoulders fall. That was a wake up call. So that gives a little bit of a voice to what it starts to look like as man as uh, burnout manifests. And, you know, when we think about even just what the definition of it is, Ben referenced earlier, well, World Health Organization actually called this a, a diagnosis before the pandemic. And when you look at I think we've got a, a for those who can see, I think we, we share what that definition actually looks like from the World Health Organization. But when you start to look at what burnout is, it's not just the long hours. It's what you heard in the sentiments that I just read out. It is a it is a, an energy depletion. It's a mental distancing. It's a reduced professional efficacy. It is it, we like to simply state it. It's getting to the end of a day and still not feeling a sense of personal accomplishment at the end of the day. And we know there's a lot of impact that comes from that. Um, there's a lot of, uh, as we've researched this, we've actually seen some of those impacts. We can share a few with you here. Um, it starts to impact, you know, even how individuals uh, are, are feeling uh, personally with their own health. We know people are 63% more likely to take a sick day if they're in that place of burnout. We know you're 2.6 times more likely to be looking for a different job. Um, in fact, in some of these conversations, I remember hearing comments like, you know, I'm ready to cry uncle and I am open to something else. And I think when organizations hear their top performers saying something like that, it's a wake up call that this is something we have to pay attention to or we're gonna lose good people around it. And then we know, you know, I remember talking talking with a, a leader at this organization, talking about burnout on her team. And one of the things that she told me, uh, she's head of a, their HR in India, and she said, she said, you know, I, I'm tired of having to explain things twice to my burnout team because they're not mentally getting it the first time. So that that confidence level that even comes, you know, with that. And the final thing I'll share with you, and I think Devin, this sets us up nicely for some of the rest of the conversation, but is when we've looked at the root causes of burnout, we've actually been able to identify five primary root causes um, that contribute to burnout. So how do you get to the point of some of those quotes that I just shared with you? Um, we see it's five things. One thing that, that contributes to this is an unfair work environment. And so you can imagine the emotional, psychological stress. Um, you heard that even in one of the comments that I shared that starts to come with any element of unfairness. And that could be around pay, that could be around uh, discrimination. It's a lot of ways that can manifest. Second, you see um, unmanageable workload. We know from our own engagement research that there is a, a, a big emphasis on organizations um, being able or individuals being able to feel like they can be focused at work and know, know what's expected of them. And when they feel like there's either competing priorities or constantly changing priorities, um, and there's just no way of getting on top of that, it can feel unmanageable. When there's unclear communication from their managers, um, when there's lack of support from the manager, our research shows about 70% of how people feel about the workplace is actually attributed back to how their local level, local level manager is managing. People don't tend to leave a workplace, they leave that local level experience in that manager. Um, and so there's a lot of things managers can do and organizations can empower their managers 
leaders to do to be having conversations that help with this. And then finally, that unreasonable time pressure. And that time pressure, it's interesting to add the layer of perception on top of all of these things, because take it back to the definition that I shared with you, there's a difference in working long hours and what you're doing in working those long hours. So my perception of working long hours, if I'm doing something I love, I might still feel um, I might feel very differently at the end of those long hours. In fact, tired but fulfilled. Where you, when you're in a place of burnout, oftentimes what we do see is that a recipe for burnout is you're doing something that drains your energy and you're being asked to do it over and over and over again. So that unreasonable pressure and how you're perceiving that um, can also uh, be impacted by the filter of the type of work you're doing within those hours. So that's the five primary root causes that we see. And I think understanding those helps us have a, a little better insight into where we can actually address the root issues inside of organizations too. This is amazing information. Thank you for sharing. I want to call out uh, Laura in the chat and she said she's very interesting to see this. I hope that that met expectations um, because that so many things jumped out to me. Um, one thing that I, I did want to ask you about um, was the employee engagement going up while burnout continued to have a negative impact. Um, is a lot of this due to the digitalization um, that we have really been thrust into over the past year? I think of so many organizations you know, showcasing virtual happy hours or, you know, Phenom, excuse me, Phenom Cooks events is something that we do here. Um, it, is part of that maybe the idea that, that people are still logged into their, their devices when, when they're attending these events where, you know, they're watching something that's going on or engaging with colleagues, but right at the bottom of their screen is that project that's due tomorrow or something like that versus back in 2019, which feels like two, three years ago when people would go out for a happy hour, you know, kind of let their hair down as, as I would do. Um, and you'd put your phone to the side, right? Your laptop would be in your bag or whatever it may be. And you could actually unplug. Is there a correlation there um, that you found? You know, it's, it's really, that's a really great question. You know, I can't speak cause and effect wise, but um, certainly uh, technology has a double-edged sword. Because in one way, it's helping us collaborate better. So workplaces are really struggling with relationships, connectivity, collaboration, things like that. So certainly technology has enabled that. But what I can tell you from the research, too, is technology um, as a layer of challenge and stress and complexity. Um, I, I've worked on some collaboration studies where, especially when it's new technology and people are learning to use it and adopt it, it, it actually makes I, I shouldn't say it makes collaboration worse, but collaboration is worse at first because collaboration is hard in the first place. And then you're layering on something to learn on top of that. An another couple interesting angles there that you pointed out, there are scientific studies about how our brain reacts to things like that. Um, so all, all, all those pieces of technology create great cognitive load, especially when they're intentionally pinging you constantly, right? And intentionally taking your attention. And there's one really good study, um, uh, experimental study that shows that um, when people took a mental ability test, which are very stable, people tend to get the same results over and over, no matter what. They they had three experimental conditions, and one um, had people taking the test with their their phone just on their desk, not on, not ringing, mm -hmm. just there. Another condition, they had it in their like a book bag behind them, so they couldn't see it, but it was in the room. And a third condition, they had to leave them outside the room, check them at the door at the beginning of the study, and people actually scored worse on the intelligence tests when the phone was in front of them, followed by behind them, followed by um, outside the room, which really it speaks to the, the distraction, the cognitive distraction we cause. And kind of one more thing too, is there's cortisol studies and things like that that actually show that checking your phone can be like having an ad addiction. When you, when you check it, it, it actually releases chemicals in your brain that gives you gratification and, and, and relief. So um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a few things to be concerned about there, I, I would say. It's, it's Jillian, interesting. Some, oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, so Jillian, probably some real comments to like add to how that affects people. <laughs> No, I think, I think you're spot on with that. Um, and, you know, to that point, we, we were already seeing that before COVID, too. Um, I think, you know, just as, as we've walked through everything in this last year, like I said, it's it's not work-life balance anymore. It is work-life integration. And technology, um, I, I love your point there, Ben, that it can work for us or against us. And so um, I think the question for us is it's not going away. How do we how do we make it work for
for us um, in a way that that we can still help people feel like it's 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 not fighting their well-being, but it's actually enabling their well-being. And so how do we you know find ways to create boundaries where people need? Um, I know even within Gallup, like one of the things we've started to do is, you know, meetings a end an hour meeting at 50 minutes instead of 60 minutes and, uh, you know, 20 and end a 30 minute meeting at 25 minutes, just little things you can kind of build in to protect some of those things that, um, you know, that might happen in a more digitized world. Um, those little things, you know, do do add up over over time. Um, but like I said, you can also think about using technology. What do we know people need? People still need that relational connection and um, how technology can be an enabler of that. And so how do we find ways where that's meaningful um, or it can still enable us to collaborate in different ways? And where do we do that in ways that's energizing and intentional as a part of teams? It's it's so interesting that you mentioned the, the notifications because I have a personal story where if I go up to my, my kitchen sink, right, to get some water and I keep my Bluetooth headphones in, which is fantastic technology, I hear that Slack notification. And sometimes it's just like nails on a chalkboard where it's like, oh, no, like I just... So I'm going to start to take them out and, and step away. Um, but my my next question for you um, comes a little bit from from my recruitment background. Oftentimes, um, I know from from the staffing industry is when we hear about or when I heard about you know individuals being burnt out. Oftentimes, a manager's recommendation was, "Well, we can pay them more money." Um, is this something that can actually solve burnout, or does it at the end of the day just throw more gasoline onto the fire, as you put? I can take that one. I actually used to work, work in staffing too, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so what's interesting is that pay is usually not the largest determinant of like happiness and burnout, things like that, um, unless people are way underpaid to the point they're having trouble paying their bills, taking care of their family, um, um, things like that. Or they may be stressed out because they know they can get a lot more pay at another company for like the same job and responsibility. So like it, I'm not saying pay is not important. It's definitely important. We all care about it, but it's very, it's very perceptual in value. So what we're what we're seeing is that um, you know the experience at work matters a lot. For ex for instance, if an employee is engaged, uh, it takes about 20% more pay to pull them away from their job because yeah, you know they're clear on what they do, they like what they do, they're positioned well. It's meaningful work. Um, so that, you know it's it's a meaningful job. Um, the other thing we're seeing is that we saw pre pre pandemic and now especially as a result of the pandemic is is flexibility. So um, people that was the top perk people wanted pre COVID and previously they'd take maybe a three to six percent pay cut for it. Um, now I believe that'll be more of a requirement going forward to have that flexibility of flex time remote work is so many people got a taste of it. Um, so I think if organizations aren't taking that flexibility seriously going forward, they're going to have trouble attracting and retaining top talent, especially now that recruiting is really borderless. You can get great talent from all over the place. So again, not to play down the money part because it, it does matter, um, but it's usually if pays way off or in combination with something else. So like if they have low pay and poor engagement or low pay and a poor manager, they're not positioned well. Um, so I, I would really focus on the flexibility of the culture and the engaging your employee, you know, assuming they're at least paid fairly yes. to market. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because it, almost a, a cliche behind burnout is oftentimes associated with the number of hours that employees work, right? That they're logging in at, you know, 3 a.m. for your example, Jillian, and logging off at 7, 8, 9 p.m., whatever it may be. Um, but I know Gallup found that it's so much more than that. Um, and the real causes are oftentimes, you know, physically demanding, whether it be you're kind of glued to your chair on a regular basis. My chiropractor yelled at me last week and said every 15 to 20 minutes, you got to stand up to let your body reset. Um, but also the mental and emotional aspect. So uh, as it, you, we, we talk about managers, what can they do to kind of encourage some of these additional root causes or uh, I guess not encourage, but um, react to them and, and make them better for, for their employees? So I'll give us um, one encouraging statistic that stood out to me just from looking at this research is a, a simple one. And that is if an employee feels like their manager is willing to listen to their workplace concerns, keyword listen, they are 62% less likely to be burned out. So catch that statistic for just a minute, 62% less likely to be burned out if you simply feel like your manager is willing to listen to your workplace concerns. Um, so I would say number one thing that anyone who's managing people can do, um, ask 
and listen. Create a safe space for people just to share what is going through their minds, what they're carrying, especially where oftentimes we're in an environment where people don't have as many support systems, you know, right around them. So that ask and listen is kind of step number one. Um, I would also say if you bring this down to just fundamental needs of the workplace, when we look at our drivers of engagement, the most basic needs that individuals have that really align with a lot of the, uh, the, the core causes of burnout the, those basic needs are, I need to feel focused. I need to feel free from unnecessary stress. I need to feel set up to still feel like I can do my best work and play to my strengths. And I need to feel recognized and validated. So if I take those elements and think about what a manager can do with that, number one, ask after you ask and listen, right, is one, help your people prioritize on what's important and not important. What do they have on their plate right now? Where are the things that are negotiable? Um, I think anytime, anytime someone can feel like that is a collaborative process, it actually increases their own engagement. Go back to what Ben was talking about, even with flexibility. Why are people more engaged when they're more when they're experiencing a more flexible work environment? It, it's actually less with the number of hours. They tend to work more hours when it's flexible. Um, but there's more autonomy. And autonomy, when you listen to the voice behind burnout, oftentimes people in a place of burnout feel like everything is happening to them and they have no agency. Any way you as a manager can help to have that collaborative discussion around what your priorities are, it helps give that individual agency in what they're prioritizing, what they're saying yes and no to, and where they're focusing their energy. Move up those, those elements, so help prioritize after you've asked and listened. Um, remove obstacles of unnecessary stress. So what are, what are unnecessary stressors that are happening? It could be the technology piece. It could be, you know, they're taking on something that they don't need to right now. So removing obstacles that you hear for someone. And then um, I'll add in, uh, based on the, uh, the, I'll kind of summarize those last elements by connect and validate. So if I even just put this in words, this is not Gallup words, but this is taking our Gallup research and putting it into, into some words for us. But ask, listen, prioritize, remove obstacles, connect and validate. And what I mean by connect and validate, connect, um, we've got to help people, first of all, feel connected to one another. We know a risk, particularly in remote working, is isolation. And so any way that we can can um, make it encourage teamwork, encourage people to be partnering with someone else, feeling like you're not alone in something can help. Uh, and then finally, validate. I think what I mean by validate is validate um, who the person is, what their strengths are. We know there's a lot of power in strengths-based feedback. Um, we also know that there's power in recognition. That was a, an incredibly interesting insight that I got to hear through these interviews that I did. I asked people, what do you want right now when you're in a place of burnout? And they said recognition, and they didn't mean it like an award. They meant, I want someone to see me working this hard and see what I'm going through and to validate my existence and my contribution in this season. And so if a manager can help to see someone someone, validate them, what they're contributing, where to position them, and then connect them to purpose. So validate their contribution that they're making. We know helping someone see um, how they're contributing to something that's bigger than themselves and having that connection to purpose is also something that um, that can sometimes pull us out of that place of being so overwhelmed by the minutia in front of us um, to see the bigger picture and, and even recalibrate based on you know what, what we feel like that purpose is and how that informs what we're prioritizing and, and where we can negotiate things. So ask and listen, prioritize, remove obstacles, connect and validate. Awesome. And I know even though those aren't Gallup's words, our graphic designers are already making a social pile <laughs> that we're going to put up. And, and I'm just kidding. Um, no, that's 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 fantastic. Um, it brought up another thought that I had there, where you mentioned simply work-related obstacles, right? But I know Ben mentioned at the, the top of the program that, that some of the events that happened over the summer with social injustice also had an impact. Um, are there conversations that should be had between managers and employees? where they talk about things that potentially aren't work related to avoid some of those isolation feelings and, and really get things potentially externally from the organization off their chest. Um, in, is there a, a space that they should create for that? Or how, how can you have those conversations uh, simultaneously with work obstacles, as you mentioned? 
Yeah, I think it's such a good question, Devin. And it, it is, it's always a little of a tricky one, right? Because it's, you don't want to force someone to talk about things if they're not comfortable talking about some of those things that aren't directly related to their work, but yet you want to create a safe space for it. Um, so I think it's more about opening the door. I think where we've seen organizations do that successfully is when you're measuring well-being, it automatically gives you an impetus for the conversation. One thing we've done within Gallup is even at the beginning of the year, part of your conversation for planning for the year with your own manager or leader is is what's going to set you up well for your own well-being this year, engagement and performance. So even a question like that that gets you talking about, we care about your well-being, we care about your engagement, we care about your performance, right? Let's talk about how we set you up well for each one of those. And yeah, Devin, an interesting point with, with this past year, obviously there was a lot weighing on people, I think, um, emotionally, mentally, psychologically with everything else that was going on in the world. And even when I go back, uh, I, I went back and looked at that that quote that you heard me say that was specific to some of the um, movements that were happening. And, and you heard that stress of the emotional and, and um, kind of psychological weight of what was going on. And interestingly enough, um, the rest of that conversation, this individual actually shared how um, a leader uh, essentially opened the door for her to share her own story and how much that meant to be able to have a safe space. And I'll even use the word she said, having a chance to use your voice with no retaliation has helped. Being able to be transparent and vocal helps. Um, uh, and, and that came from having conversations with her own leader. So I think anytime we can enable someone to, to, to open that door, um, you know, not force it, but hey, uh, what else What else do we need to, to talk about? How are you doing? You know, what else matters to your well-being, engagement and performance on those team? Because all those things intersect. And um, I think that the organizations that will win the war for talent in the future won't be thinking about just engagement, but they'll be thinking about engagement and well-being in connection to performance because um, those are intersecting more than ever based on what we're seeing in changes of the workforce. Absolutely. Um, just want a friendly reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to fire those away in the chat section. Um, Jillian, you just mentioned um, engagement and well-being quite a few times, and it reminded me <laughs> of, of Ben at the top of the conversation talking about the engagement well-being paradox. Uh, so could you dive a little bit more into that and, and, and maybe explain it to uh, a newbie uh, uh, like me? <laughs> without, without slides and data, I'll try. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. You, like I mentioned before, usually engagement and well-being move together. So the paradox is they're they're diverging, and that divergence is accelerated um, for people working remotely. But what that means in, in, in real terms is that we've seen those challenges managed in one of two ways. It's kind of, it's kind of a tipping point. It's going to go one way or another. Um, we see that when managers and teams and organizations are able to lean into well-being and engagement. Like Jillian said, we see when managers are able to address these root causes, and we especially see when managers get really good at having frequent, meaningful conversations with their employees and teams. We actually observe that um, they're able to take advantages of the opportunities of working from home and, and bringing, rallying each other around some of these concerns. And we see that it translates to much higher engagement and performance and productivity and lower burnout. So um, truly, if we look at, for instance, the people who work 100% from home, like right now is about 40% of people, that's not really flexibility because you're trapped at home, right? Like you're forced there. Before that used to be by choice and you were ready and prepared and, and we just got thrown into it. Um, so, you know, you're trapped at home. With, kids at your feet or your cat or, or whatever, you know, so that's, that's really different. But what we've observed in how you handle that when, when managers don't have frequent meaningful conversations with their people, that group of um, 100% work from home employees has terrible engagement, the worst. Um, when they are engaged and have frequent meaningful conversations that focus on recognition, well-being, purpose, like Jillian said, they're actually more engaged than anybody else. So they're able to take advantage of the opportunities from work from home. So like flexibility is not a silver bullet either. It's what you do with it, you know? So that's that's kind of the result of how you handle the engagement well-being paradox is either um, it's gonna go one of two ways. Either you're gonna take advantage of things and, and, and create a stronger, better workplace in the long, long run, even as we transition back to work and probably have more hybrid teams and things like that. Um, or on the flip side, um, 
th- these scenarios are going to throw you into a tailspin. Uh, the the remote work and being disconnected and the stress is going to snowball on employees in their organization. Um, and it's going to be hard to recover. And as you can imagine, uh, most organizations were concerned about many of these things before, but it wasn't prioritized. You know, well-being, DEI, um, just flat out better people management were concerned. I mean, how, how do you have a DEI conversation or a hard conversation if you don't already have a cadence of trust and strong conversations with your people so they know they're starting from a tough spot in some circumstances but on on the bright side there's people who've been doing a great job of all these things for a long time too so we're trying to lean into that model model what works um and and create an opportunity here um to tackle some of the things that you know we probably should have tackled a long time ago it's it's funny that you mentioned being being trapped at home and uh, you know not being able to escape. Immediately, my mind went back to, and this may just be because I'm in the Northeast with snow. But do you remember when snow days were a thing where you didn't have yes, to? They you were know, actually you, cool. We looked fun. <laughs> <to them. laughs> yeah, it was a break from your commute. You maybe slept in a little bit longer. You got to treat yourself to a, a lunch that you wouldn't typically have in the office. It seems like that's completely gone out the window. It snowed quite a bit in the Northeast this year, and it's. Oh, it's just a regular day. Here we go doing it again. So uh, that was something that, that jumped out to me. Um, but Jillian, you, you mentioned uh, quite a few solutions and suggestions as to how organizations can, can really tackle these and, and get in front of burnout issues. Um, what are some of the best ways to truly make that sustainable um, long term? Obviously, the country's beginning to reopen in areas. Um, and as you know, you shared at the beginning, burnout isn't something new. You guys have started your, your research back in 2016. Um, and we don't want this conversation to end once things return to the new normal. So how do you, you truly make a sustainable work environment to prevent burnout or um, inhibit it from, from getting worse than it already is? Yeah, yeah, that's such a good question. And I think, you know, what we've shared so far is really focused on what a a local level manager can do. When I think about that more at the organizational level, um, to make something sustainable, you you have to find uh, the the levers for ongoing conversation around it. And, um, you know, for us, obviously, research is a big part of who we are in our DNA. And we tend to find in organizations, if you measure something, people will manage to it. And if you report on it, and you then, you know, that's kind of step number one. So I think um, for organizations, um, like we said, the critical juncture that we're at is yes, engagement, but engagement and well-being. So I think the next frontier will be the culture of both of those things together, engagement, uh, well-being and performance, I'll say, um, you know, that, that all those things, like we said, intersect. And so um, being able to, to have a lot of times we'll add in questions around that if we're doing something like even in a current employee engagement survey, but where you're adding well-being or burnout related questions to keep pulsing on that. Um, So that's step number one, because it gives you something to respond to and understand your current state. I think step number two is take what I shared with you earlier on why the manager is so important, because 70% of how people feel about their workplace goes back to their manager. One of the big shifts we've seen in our research over time is that people don't want this boss concept anymore. And I'm putting that in air quotes for anyone that's listening. Uh, But this boss uh, is, is, is not a concept that resonates. What does resonate is a coach. Now think about that with what Ben shared with you. We've got this lovely data that when you're looking at, uh, essentially there's this, this correlation between the more an individual employee feels like they're having meaningful feedback and communication touch points with their own manager, the higher their engagement. Such a simple lever, lever to be able to pull. So what I think that means for us is we have to find ways to make that an expectation of anyone managing people, that it's not just the work, but we're truly upholding people management in a way that is um, uh, upholding values of engagement, well-being, performance. And so, um, you know, for, from a Gallup standpoint, we've we've put a whole journey in place called Boss to Coach. And a lot of that is, is really trying to equip managers to do just that. And so I think any organization thinking about how to equip their managers to do that. And then the final thing I'll mention, um, you know, from uh, from what Ben was saying is is that um, I do think a very real topic, and I think this came up in the chat here too, is as the changing nature of the workforce is how do we build in flexibility into the actual roles themselves, um, realizing that, um, that that is something that's important and desirable, but knowing that to Ben's point, that flexibility and how that's experienced is highly dependent on how good your managers are at managing to that. Um, and so having, I think those kind of three elements together 
measure well-being, focus on it at, from a cultural perspective. We look at like how people think about well-being. It's it's physical, it's financial, it's community, it's social, it's your work. Um, kind of looking across your systems that way, and and in some to some degree, having policies that align with creating a culture of well-being, celebrating those things empowering your managers to actually have the right conversations around that with your people um, and then having the infrastructure and roles that actually support allowing for that at the individual level. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think you were talking about Nancy's uh, question in there uh, about a post-pandemic work policy. So thank you for, for answering that. Um, my last question for, for both of you is this has been, I know, genuinely a, a thought-provoking session for me. Um, it's got me kind of rewiring the way I'm doing things. I'm going to take my headphones out when I go to get more water after this call. Um, but if somebody is interested in finding out more or uh, potentially reading more on this research, where is a place where they can obviously access the fantastic data and information that Gallup has put together. Yeah, sure. So I mentioned our uh, report called The Causes and Cures of Burnout that we have online. We also have what we call a landing page on our website that provides several different resources. Um, and we and we have landing pages like that for the boss to coach information. Um, Jill, Jillian shared as well. And, and we're happy for uh, you folks to always reach out to us too. Uh, Jillian, do you have anything else you'd share? Yeah, those are those are some rich resources, by the way, that that perspective paper, Ben and the team um, really did uh, put a lot of great insight into that. I think for for staying fresh on anything, those those are your best places for that landing page that Ben referenced for staying fresh on anything. Gallup.com is where we, we put all of our latest articles. Um, we've also got an upcoming Gallup at Work Summit that's going to be happening in June. And in fact, uh, Ben, I think you and I are leading a session on on how to um, create good hybrid team experiences. <laughs> and so so um, we know that's a hot topic related to what Nancy was asking in the chat here, too, is how is the workforce changing? We know there's going to be more hybrid teams in the future. And so, you know, if you want to stay ahead of some of those things, um, those can be helpful resources with uh, both articles as well as as uh, that Gallup at Work Summit. Yeah, awesome. I, I hope you're leading that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to come along, though. Um, yeah, well, I like too where you took that last comment in, in relation to what Nancy said too. You know, we're certainly seeing that every organization is thinking about that return to the workplace, which means um, leading remote teams, leading hybrid teams, and a safe return to work. So, you know, yeah. everyone's kind of thinking about that, and I think today's discussion is an excellent lens for making sure you do that right. And that, you know, we come out of this pandemic much stronger than we went into it. Mm. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time. Uh, I will let you get back to your, your busy days and, and lives. Um, hopefully we can do this again in, in person maybe, or, or something along those lines, finger across. Um, but I'll, I'll let you both go and, and, and thanks again. If you have any questions, um, like the gallup.com, right? Or um, you can always reach out to our, um, or email txl at feedonpeople.com and we'll be more than happy to shoot them over to, to Ben and Jillian. But thank you so much and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, it's been a pleasure joining you. We appreciate awesome. it. See ya. Well, there you have it. Uh, that was everything that you, you truly need to know about remote work burnout and actually some some really quick fixes as to how to to, to fight it off and, and, and ensure that you are having a sustainable workplace. Um, it is tradition around these parts that we always promote uh, our last episode, which was uh, something around confessions of a hiring manager. Uh, we all know that with great hiring power comes great responsibility, and it's up to both the recruiter and manager to pull out all the stops in searching for the right talent. Uh, so in this clip, the hiring manager guest who would not reveal their actual identity, we still need some super sleuths to figure that out. Uh, they, he discusses uh, the number one most important interview tactic in his hiring manager success. So let's hear the clip. Hiring managers, what is the biggest red flag on a resume? So you're assuming the hiring manager is looking at the resume. First yes. of all, you're, you're assuming. That's that. Okay. Yeah. So I'll confess, rarely do I ever look at a resume. And usually before I speak to the candidate, I don't even look at their LinkedIn profile. Do, do you think that's weird? I think it's a, a little bit strange. How do you know uh, what questions to ask about their experience if you don't know specifically what roles they have um, or where they were previously? This is where the recruiter is so powerful. The recruiters I've worked with in my past are really, really good about getting the right candidates to me. I trust them. In fact, I tell the recruiters I work with, if you think the candidate's right, just schedule time with me. 
I don't need to look at the resume, look at their profile, give you the approval to schedule. I don't need that. Just schedule with me and we go from there. So that's one thing. And second, I, I don't want to have a bias before I ever speak to the candidate. The, the, if I know nothing about them, I want to treat this conversation like I ran into you waiting in line at the subway. That's how I want the conversation to start and to get to know someone, because that's what I'm really trying to do in my interview is get to know them. And I want them to get to know me and the company. And I wish I would have known earlier what an interview could be, because I spent a lot of my hiring and a lot of my time hiring the way I was told it should be rating systems and and in different ways to ask questions. And you know what I found after working through those, I found having the most genuine conversation I can possibly have with a candidate has produced the best results for me as a hiring manager. Definitely check out that episode, Confessions of a Hiring Manager. You can find it on the Phenom blog, which of course is phenom.com backslash blog, or YouTube. It is also there. The blog has nice little clips, though, so definitely check that out. I thank you all once again for tuning into a spectacular conversation today with Gallup all around burnout. If you missed a little bit or just want to replay uh, to take some notes and maybe implement into your daily strategy, feel free to access it at the blog or YouTube as well. A special thank you to Mary, Melissa, Nancy, Laura, Daniel, Tom, Robert, Baleen. Um, we love the interaction back and forth. Uh, can't wait to see you next week. We have another fantastic episode uh, Thursday noon Eastern time. I'll see you there. Thanks. Thank <sighs> you.